Hello friends, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our viewers who have joined from different parts of the world today. Welcome to this session of APCR SHR 10 virtual, the ongoing virtual series of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. This virtual conference comprising 14 thematic sessions is being co-hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia and CNS. These sessions are also streamed live on the Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. Today's session is the 12th in the series and it is on the theme of HIV AIDS and SRHR in Asia Pacific. The session is in the lead up to the World's Aid Day, which as we all know is on 1st of December, and also in the lead up to the 16 days of activism against sexual and other forms of gender-based violence, which begin from 25th November, that is day after tomorrow. And we are really happy to have two sign language interpreters today to guide today's session for the benefit of our audience, Nick Sang and Lucy Lim. Just a few quick housekeeping announcements for our viewers before I hand over the mic to our chairperson for today. My humble request to all presenters to please adhere to your allotted time. And there will be a prompt from the chairperson two minutes before the scheduled time ends. Uh, audience, please keep yourself muted and your videos turned off throughout the session. Presenters are also requested to mute themselves when not speaking. Uh, there will be a question and answer session after all speakers have presented. And those who are using Zoom platform can type in their comments and questions in the chat box. You can do so even as speakers present and not wait till the end. If you are watching it on Facebook Live, you can type in your questions in the comment box there. And in the interest of time, please keep your questions and comments brief and precise. Also, all of us are living in challenging times and most of us are working from home. So please bear with each other in case of any technical glitches, which sometimes arise from nowhere and which are beyond our control. I now hand over the mic to our chairperson, Dr. Jennifer Butler. Jennifer has worked for UNFPA for 14 years, co-convening the UNAIDS family work on HIV and key populations globally and regionally across Eastern Europe and Central Asia. She has also served as UNFPA's Deputy Regional Director for Asia and the Pacific, Country Representative for India, and country director for Bhutan, and as global coordinator for ICPD 25 and UNFPA at 50. Her main focus is for social justice, working with people and communities who experience social exclusion. This has spanned HIV, sexual and reproductive health and rights, indigenous communities, and ethnic minorities people key populations, pe uh, people, and uh, people and rural and remote communities. Jennifer is currently serving as director of UNFPA Pacific Sub-Regional Office based in Fiji. But today she is joining us from Melbourne. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Shoba. It's a very, very nice introduction and hello to everyone wherever you are and at whatever time of the day that it is for you. This is such an exciting session and I would like to start by congratulating uh, the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. This virtual series has been absolutely sensational. We're at number 12 of these fortnightly sessions and I think for all of us it's been a terrific opportunity to keep us connected, to keep us learning, to keep us 
together and, and really moving forward in this most challenging, challenging period of COVID-19. I actually think the seminar series serves as a model for how we can move beyond conferences and doing it in a virtual space as an ongoing form of keeping a community together. I'm really thrilled to invite all of you to sit back and listen and enjoy the discussions and learnings that we're going to hear from our tremendous panelists today. This virtual session on HIV and AIDS and SRHR in Asia and Pacific is extremely important. For me, I, I'm really thrilled that I was asked to chair because this is an area I've worked on for so many years of my life. I actually get emotional about it because it's so fabulous to work in this area and particularly to listen to today's presentations with a focus very much around key populations as well. For all of us who work in the sphere of sexual reproductive health and rights, we know who is included and who is commonly not included in when we're talking about maternal health, when we're talking about access to adolescent health, when we're talking about access to condoms, when we're talking about quality of services, and we know who is actually left behind. As we move towards 2030, we can no longer leave anybody behind. That is what governments have committed to. That's what civil society is committed to. And that's what we'll hear today from all of our panelists. Just very briefly, there are some key elements that are crucial. Community empowerment and leadership of fundamental importance. In the HIV world, we learned this very early on. And in the SRHR field, it's becoming an increasingly critical mode of engagement. Access to quality services is really high on the agenda. Ensuring that women who are sex workers, that gay, and, gay men and men who are sex with men have access to anal health services, that transgender communities, transgender men, transgender women have access to the services that they need, the services that actually are ones that best suit their health. For people who inject drugs, that they're fully incorporated within our overall sexual reproductive health services, that we finally move beyond the limitations of our current service model and assume that women who sell sex and women who inject drugs somehow don't become mothers, somehow don't become pregnant, somehow don't need the same sorts of services as all other women everywhere else. And that gay men and men who have sex with men have different sexual health needs to, to all people, that their needs for services are just as important as those as all other men and women in the communities. For transgender communities who have been so long victimized, vilified, stigmatized, that now we have to ensure that those access to services are there. And for young people from key populations who perhaps face extraordinary challenges, we have brilliant, fantastic, sensational community-led organizations in our region who have actually shown the way of how to ensure that adolescents and young people from key populations meet the service needs, have the degrees of integration of HIV and SRHR that they need. They've shown the way around the whole world of how to get it right. So without any further talk from me, I would like to hand over to our panelists and our keynote speaker. And I know these are people that you will find as inspiring as I do. Our keynote speaker today is actually a very close friend of mine and a wonderful, wonderful person who's contributed so much across the years. Our, our speaker, as you can see, is Eamon Murphy. Eamon is Regional Director of UNAIDS in Asia and the Pacific, and he supports countries across the region in achieving the goals outlined in the 2016 United Nations Political Declaration on Ending AIDS. 
He leads and facilitates a joint UNAIDS United Nations response to support countries and their HIV programs, which includes strengthening the links between governments, civil society, the United Nations system and development partners. Eamon has previously served as UNAIDS country director in Myanmar and in Vietnam. And before joining the United Nations, Eamon held a number of senior positions with the Australian government, including Director for Health Sectors with AusAid in the Foreign Ministry, and as Assistant Secretary for Communicable Diseases and Environmental Health, and the Director of the National AIDS Program for the Commonwealth Department of Health, which is when I first met Eamon so many years ago. It's really fantastic, and I say this as someone who's worked in the UNAIDS field for so long, to have somebody with such solid health system understanding, such extraordinary experience in HIV, and such depth in his understanding of what happens with community and country-led responses. Eamon's title today of his talk is Solidarity and Accountability, HIV, SRHR, and the COVID response. Over to you, Eamon. Thank you very much, um, uh, Jennifer. Um, Jenny, it's great um, to be with you and the many colleagues who are um, online today, um, friends and colleagues across the region, looking at both these significant social and health issues of HIV and SRHR, the intersectionality of these is often not as strongly emphasized as we need to. And that's why this conference is always so important that we remind ourselves we're, we're dealing with similar issues across the region and the impact on both is, is very similar. So it's great that we're going to have a panel today. I, I don't see myself so much as a plenary speaker or as highlighting a number of the issues that other panelists are going to take to us uh, in the conversation in more depth and and then collectively have co a conversation with people who are online so it's it's really good that um, we can um, move right um, start with a brief overview of where we at in terms of the response to HIV the slides speak for themselves and the first point to make is that we are seeing some progress but we're not seeing enough progress to make us celebrate. A 12% decline over the last decade in new infections is nothing to be proud of, I'm sorry to say. We were doing much better much earlier in the response and across the region we're slipping, but we're also seeing rising new infections and you can see these in the upper part of the graph in terms of the red um, for a number of countries where we're seeing rising new infections and we're seeing them in new generations, new epidemics. In the case of the Philippines, the fastest growing epidemic in the world. And as Ambassador Burks, the head of the US PEPFAR program, describes it as a totally new epidemic to the historical epidemic that's being dealt with in the Philippines. And it's young men who have sex with men and transgender under the age of 25 primarily. So significant issues happening in different countries. And so regional data doesn't really unpack it well for us. We need to look at individual countries and look at a range of data to understand what's happening. Similarly, we are doing slightly better in terms of AIDS-related deaths. But when we look at the issue of mortality against the numbers, we're not doing nearly as well as countries like South Africa, um, because w w there are far too many people dying in our countries and despite us having robust health systems, and this is a serious challenge for us when we, we need to be looking at both of these issues. And the intersection, as I said, with sexual reproductive health issues is critical for us when we look at these together. Where are we? You mentioned key populations in the introduction. New data this year on the left of this slide shows that 98% of new infections are among key populations and their partners. Partners making up 21%, the partners and clients uh, are making up 21% of these. The largest group here are men who have sex with men. And on the right, you can see the young population and you can see it rises amongst young MSM 
to 52% of the mix. And so this is seriously a concern. You can see here also sex workers, transgender. So the, the issues that are affecting the epidemics in our region. And this is one of the greatest challenges because these are often, as you referred to, the people who are left behind. The most marginalized in society are bearing the greatest impact. And that doesn't always attract the political leadership and support that's required to address these issues effectively. It's rising amongst the young. So we're seeing second wave epidemics and we need the countries in this region to take these issues seriously. And we really need to work together on how do we integrate more and more into the program. You'll, you'll see a focus is, is very much on treatment, but not so much on prevention. So we've got the tap running while we're trying to empty the bowl underneath. And so countries really need to reprioritize and finance prevention services themselves. And with that, here's some examples of the four key population groups that you mentioned, um, Jen, in your introduction. When we look at the, the differences across countries in where, how far people are able to invest and where is the coverage levels for key populations. And here we, we've got the two groups, um, uh, young and uh, um, the over 25. So this is a serious challenge for us when we look at each population separately. And each country needs to be looking at that. Um, uh, clusters of country like ASEAN, there's a meeting on at the same time as this, where we're meeting with ASEAN uh, health um, ministries to be re-looking at the AIDS response in their countries in light of the overall health response. And, and the critical issue here is about not enough service coverage, for innovative areas of prevention, but we're not making use of the existing resources that are there and scaling them up. And so we're, we're, countries are doing a little, some are doing much better than others, and that's fantastic and that stands out. And, um, but, and we're seeing good progress in some parts of the region and slipping behind in others as the investments are small and incremental in treatment and, uh, and prevention is not keeping pace with that. So it's causing a serious um, uh, problem. Treatment. On the left of the screen, you can see the 390s targets. The first on testing, knowing their status. 75% reach in our region. We're not doing as well as other regions. We're a bit like a middle child. We're not doing as well as some regions like Eastern Southern Africa in their response. We're not doing as badly as some regions where we're seeing a faster increase in, in new infections in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, in Latin America. So we're kind of in that middle place where we're often overlooked. We need to mobilize political, and I don't mean just governmental, community leadership to re-energize, particularly amongst the young, where we're seeing a greater impact. So testing, treatment, and viral suppression. You can see those countries that have achieved the different 90s. Viral suppression, though, in most countries is reliant on one test a year. And so that doesn't really help people plan the, their, um, uh, their sexual lives um, and, and deal with um, this aspect as part of their overall health. And so this is a real challenge. On the right-hand side, you can see how are we going when we break those targets down by children, by women, by men. And you can see there's a big gap here when we go from testing to treatment. So even in the treatment cascade, we're testing people, but for some reason, the numbers are not shifting into treatment and then it's further down. But we really need to be making sure that we're getting that linkage between testing and into treatment and testing into prevention for those who test negative to HIV. So these are really serious issues that we need to be looking at. Um, the same countries where we're seeing rising epidemics, Pakistan, Indonesia, the Philippines, they have suboptimal levels of treatment coverage, and this is significant concerns. Another area of concern for both SRHR and for HIV is how do we get the young people to be able to access services? Many countries have an automatic barrier where services that are available are not available to the young adolescents without parental consent. And often young people who are experimenting with their sexuality, questioning, just taking risks as young people do, are not going to get permission from their parents to go and have testing for HIV or, or uh, STIs. Um, look at the issues here, and you can see in the red where um, um, 
you're not able to have access to services without parental consent. And this is a serious concern when we look at issues for sexual health, when we look at contraceptives, be that emergency contraceptive, if something happens, and young people take risks. We all know that. And the reality is they take more risks than older people. And so we need to be able to work out how to improve this situation across the region. The new normal, this is where the intersection that we also talked about uh, and I was asked to address of COVID. COVID is here with us, it's gonna continue with us. We see the impact of COVID changing across our region. Uh, I, I saw my great friend, um, um, Teng Teng Tay from um, Myanmar online earlier. Um, we know the sudden impact in Myanmar shows us what can happen with the epidemic of COVID, where the best um, prevention services were in place and then things can change very fast. And we're seeing that in some countries like Pakistan rising two to 5% positivity now of COVID in Islamabad. So they were doing better before. So the issues keep changing in different places. Uh, and some have serious impact of COVID constantly, like uh, Indonesia and the Philippines. So this, the challenge of COVID will be with us for a couple of years, even if the vaccines start rolling out. The top graph is the main one to look at. Look at the impact on treatment services. Now this, this assessment was done during the beginning of lockdowns and the impact of first responses to COVID. Now that has changed, I must acknowledge that, and significant, you'll see in other slides, um, innovation that's come with that. But this is really important because we have seen a slowdown. That can be just a redirection. Many of our colleagues working in sexual health, in HIV work, have been redirected to help with COVID as well. So there's an automatic impact on the programs of all programs, but we see this in treatment of HIV and quite dramatic in some compared to others. So these are serious issues. The bottom slides are just a uh, graph of just two countries. We're not equal, but a, a really strong response like Cambodia, we've seen um, a, a reduction in prevention programs. But at the same time, um, Cambodia is doing extremely well on social protection aspects uh, for people living with HIV. So at the beginning impacts, we need to see how that changes over time. Service disruption from lockdowns either in country or between countries where drug supply was a challenge in the beginning, uh, issues that have been addressed and need to continue to be addressed. One of the issues that we all deal with is um, the intersectionality. It's the centre of this slide I'd like you to look at. And we could change COVID or change HIV and put SRHR in, in one of these two circles. And it's the same issues in between that address both. Those who are unable to access as easily or are more impacted by COVID, just like HIV or SRHR services, are those affected by the centre. Some people don't have the identity cards. They need to access services. Some people are incarcerated. Um, there's a bias from um, healthcare providers in some places. Laws or local policies during crackdowns or, or lockdowns or, or preferences of different types of people impact on access to services. Obviously income, um, uh, the state of, of uh, access to shelter, to home, employment, and during COVID we've seen massive social impacts of unemployment and people in the informal sector where many of our, our, um, our um, friends that we're working to support earn their incomes have been doubly impacted and so they've lost access to um, employment to the income needed just for housing and food, let alone other forms of support, and then access to healthcare. So we could change and put SRHR in here. These are the critical issues we continue to address before COVID, and COVID has amplified and made this much harder for all of us. Some examples from across the region. If I start with Cambodia, um, Cambodia has done surveys to see what the impact is, what are the issues they need to address, where were the interruptions, and it's a positive thing that they're identifying areas they then need to address. So here you can see that the data suggests that there are significant issues in terms of access to contraception, uh, ability to obtain co condoms, particularly during the lockdowns. Um, these were uh, issues that needed to be addressed. Um, uh, also, obviously, the issue for opportunistic infections. And in some places, uh, the issue was access to uh, ARV, the HIV medicines, was also having interruptions. 
the survey of peak populations uh, in, in Cambodia looked at it, um, broke this down further, diagnostic and treatment of STIs, psychosocial support. The needs in psychosocial support because of COVID has been amplified in many people. Increases in gender-based violence, in, in um, suicidal ideation, the violence against key populations by their families, or communities because people are spending a lot more time together in close um, personal uh, space and this is causing a lot more stress and it's increased both the psychosocial challenges for people but also violence. Access to uh, services that are important like pre-exposure prophylaxis or post-exposure prophylaxis has also been a challenge. It's just one example of one country and we also then look across the region. We've worked with the ICWAP, the International Coalition of Women Living with HIV, and, and they've done a survey of the impact on people, uh, women living with HIV, who've reported a lack of access to sexual reproductive health and rights services, including contraception during the lockdowns. And so in many countries, then that's had to be addressed. In others, it hasn't been addressed sufficiently. Young key populations. A lot of work is being done by the inter, what's called an interagency task team. That's because there are many organizations addressing different parts of young um, uh, people's health and, and welfare. Uh, and so we bring them together to work across the region to look at the issues um, where there's commonality. Service disruptions or delays, condoms, pre-exposure prophylaxis, HIV testing psychosocial support, mental health medications, significant issues of access. Some of it is people afraid to go out to services, even if they are available. And that's where educational support and different forms of um, service delivery is required. So this is a serious issue uh, and it's increasing, particularly the issue on uh, creating an increase in risk taking behaviors because of the impact of COVID and a lack of communication often about COVID. Other examples for um, LGBTI, laws that criminalize sexual orientation, gender identity and expression exacerbate negative health outcomes as people may avoid accessing healthcare services for fear of arrest or violence. During COVID, we've also seen seen LGBTI being blamed for spreading COVID uh, and inappropriately in different countries. And it's also led to violence and harassment of LGBTI, which then of course increases um, their fear of access, uh, fear of arrest or violence or just stigma and discrimination, and therefore they don't access the health care services they need. Transgender women have reported difficulties, increased difficulties in accessing hormone replacement therapy in countries. A couple of examples shared here. Um, the stigma and discrimination based on um, sexual orientation, gender identity, increasing significantly during this time. COVID, as we've seen in many countries, just like we've seen for many years in HIV, is to find someone to blame. And so we blame, some countries have blamed other countries. Some countries are blaming people from certain populations. And this has been exacerbated. And those most marginalized are often those who first get blamed. Going forward, opportunities are being identified and new ways in innovation, particularly by community organizations, often in partnerships with government, of how do we deal with COVID and deal with the challenges of COVID. Alternative ways for sexual reproductive health services, including the diagnosis, the management of infections and hormone therapy. Other outlets, innovation, using pharmacies, using home delivery for people so they don't have to go into services, uh, online platforms. These innovations are happening and need to be encouraged and need to be maintained post-COVID because this is a, a way of shaking up the response. How do we change? What has been complacency? And, and in some places, the same services being provided for a long time. But this slide, just talking about young people, they are living very different lives than they were living five, 10 years ago. And certainly when Jen and I first met 30 odd years ago, very different world. Young are living in a socially connected way, way that we never imagined. Use of mobile phone and social media. Some of them have more than one phone. They have 
access through computers, many different platforms are using at the same time. And, and this, the dating apps are there for all adolescents. Um, they use, and, and Facebook, Twitter, you name the platform, are used in many different ways than uh, are originally in, uh, intended. These become both opportunities. There's data from Vietnam that show the outreach to young people by young people in um, community organizations using social media has really increased the level of testing. Now that testing can be provided online as well, sent to the home by courier and then community support by counselors to help people self-test. Sometimes, as we know, people don't want to identify, therefore they don't want to go to either a community or a government center because of the fear of social reaction or identity. Um, there, there are increased risks, the use of drugs, for sexual enhancement, chemsex as it's often referred to. Uh, that's put in place a barrier because obviously condoms are not being used. But we're not then scaling up PrEP services su sufficiently to, to counter that because PrEP would be a major tool and asset for those who are increasing their risk by combining uh, unsafe sex with um, drug use. So the same is for SRHR services and the traditional prevention models need to change to keep pace with this. There are plenty of good examples, and I'm not going to read these out for us. Many of the countries and the people online can share other examples. In the top of this, a whole range of services that have changed across the region from India, Nepal, the Philippines, PNG, Thailand, and others. This is outreach services online or delivery of your ARV medicines, multi-month dispensing. So instead of having to go to the clinic every two weeks, every month, you can get two or four month, uh, two or three months um, uh, supply of ARVs and even more in some countries or in some areas that are more heavily impacted by COVID. So this has seen an increased utilization of the policies that are often in place. And we all know this is one of the challenges. Sometimes we get good policies, but the program implementation doesn't match. Um, so community-based dispensing to support overstretched health services during the time of COVID to help keep people with vulnerabilities or, or health um, challenges away from uh, health services is critical during the time of COVID. PrEP service delivery has changed. And, and this is significant because people will still take risks during the time of COVID and sexual behaviors will um, continue um, or change. And access to, to pre prevention me methods need to be in place. So there's some of the examples at the regional level to get the information out. Community members often look to other community members to hear information, not just rely on multiple sources. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. So we've worked with um, partners across the UN um, and with community organizations um, where everyone's combining efforts to make sure that best practice examples are out there, information is out there um, across the region. Another area that um, we really need to, to look at, both now for SRHR and HIV services, but as we go forward, when looking at sustainability of services, is the issue of universal health coverage. And we need to challenge the understandings of UHC in our own countries. There are a lot of different definitions, a lot of different policies, and often it's too heavily focused on treatment. So what is it? It should be about systems for health, not a single health system, which usually means a largely biomedical government health system. It doesn't often take enough of that multi-sectoral aspect of um, a public health response. And we've seen that in SR. HR and we've seen it in HIV, they're critical to success. And so seeing the community as part of those systems for health is critical to um, addressing universal health coverage and making it what we need it to be. Cover the spectrum, not only treatment, we need um, prevention. Um, Pakistan has just released its essential services package and it includes HIV and aspects of sexual health prevention services, including condoms in their essential services package. It's a great model for other countries to look at. Equity and development priorities, social inclusion. How do we make sure those most left behind are getting first priority? Because they are the often the ones who need the most access to health services at the outset. Focus at the community level. And it shouldn't just be focused solely on the issues of health financing. We need a minimum package 
that is focused on the right to health for everybody. And we need to be looking and focusing on people, not on diseases. So this is a really important issue for us as we look together, as we move forward. We need to increase much more joint advocacy, much more joint programming between SRHR and HIV. And that's not to put the responsibility on either. Sometimes HIV programs operate far too isolated to SRHR programs, but sometimes it's the reverse. I, I always recall being in a, an early meeting uh, with a group um, when I, I arrived in Vietnam and they were talking about condoms and I made a, a comment. They said, no, no, we're talking about condoms for reproductive health. And I'm thinking, how many different types of condoms does one person have? So how do we look at these issues? How do we bring these together? Um, it's the same for HIV and TB services. So we really need to be looking and using universal health coverage to look at how do we do greater intervention, uh, integration and interventions that are not disease focused but focused on the people and what are the needs of individuals collectively um, so that's really important that we we look at how we bring those together the purpose of my presentation was just to touch on a number of areas and i look forward to the discussion after we hear more in-depth examples from the different speakers on the panel so jen without uh, going further i'd like to hand back to you and i'm really really excited to be part of this panel um the 12th of these that you're having uh, as part of the online conference and often these online conferences now we're seeing are reaching a much larger and more diverse audience than the old face-to-face -face conferences because of the, the, the access issues. So I'm really excited to be part of this and very grateful to be asked to be on this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eamon. That was everything that everyone hoped for and more. It was inspirational, it was detailed, uh, it had depth. And we could spend like the entire time just drilling down into it. But you know, the community solidarity and resilience in the time of COVID-19 pandemic, just as one example, absolutely fantastic. It shows that we need to take the opportunities that COVID-19 brings in addition to understanding the incredible complexity and difficulties that it's authoring in. And taking the lessons learned from the 30 years of the HIV pandemic, which itself has gone through periods of very, very heightened impact on major communities and using those lessons to help shape responses on COVID-19. So it was really, really brilliant. Thank you so much. I would now like to go to our first abstract presenter, Jude Tayeben. And Jude Tayeben is the current Dean of the College of Nursing at Bangor State University at La Trinidad, Benguet in the Philippines. He is the coordinator of the Reproductive Health Care Center, the Adi Vyan Youth Health Center, an extension program within the university, the Benguet State University for the youth in Benguet and the Cordillera region. AYHC provides a reproductive health and sexuality services and advocates for the rights with compassion to empower young people. We're really looking forward Jude, to your presentation um, and the title of which is Successes, Pitfalls and Moving Forward. Adiyan Youth Health Centre, a school-based program addressing adolescent sexuality and reproductive health issues in Bengal in the Philippines absolutely fascinating title and we're handing the floor over to you now Jude. Thank you Jennifer. Good afternoon everyone from the Philippines. My presentation this afternoon is uh, we just want to share some of our insights or learning insights about the program that we are implementing in a uh, state university here in Benguet province, Northern Philippines. So we will talk about the successes, pitfalls and moving forward. The Adivine Youth Health Center, this is a school-based program addressing 
adolescent sexually, uh, sexuality and reproductive health issues in Benguet. So yours truly is the program coordinator of this program and also the current dean of the College of Nursing, Benguet State University. I just want to uh, just give you a background where I'm coming from. So I'm from Benguet State University. Uh, we have three campuses, La Trinidad, Bugyas, and Bukod, located in Benguet, and we have at least 10,000 students yearly. And of course, the program that we are handling, we are from the College of Nursing, we offer the Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Just to give you a big, brief victory, uh, history, I mean, the Reproductive Healthcare Center started actually in 1994 as an extension program in partnership with the PIGO, the John Hopkins Program for International Education and Reproductive Health. This is actually served as a resource learning center on reproductive health uh, for nurses and uh, midwifery. So it's also a service provider for surgical screening, artificial and natural family planning methods. However, it, uh, it was a uh, stop in 2000, early 2000 because of uh, no funding anymore from JPAIGO. However, in 2016, we conducted this uh, survey uh, with me is uh, Mrs. Tinga about the reproductive health and sexuality. This is a survey among 15 to 19 years old students of Benguet State University. Because we were alarm, alarmed at the time of the statistics that we are receiving that there are indeed increasing of cases of teen pregnancy and even HIV AIDS in the province. So this is to determine the extent of knowledge, awareness, and attitude on reproductive health, sexuality, the gender, and norms towards sexual activities. So we're able to uh, collect data from 322 students who participated in the survey. So from the survey, we got these results. So the knowledge to RPR is the reproductive, the reproductive health law is significantly high. They are also aware on the adolescent and youth reproductive health programs like guidance and counseling. Uh, they are seen in hospitals, clinics, including schools and healthcare organizations. However, um, in terms of their attitudes and behaviors, they claim that the girls who have sex before, most girls who have sex before marriage regret it afterwards, got 51.86%, uh, and most boys who have sex before marriage afterwards, 18.63, which is, uh, we found it's at opposing results, no? However, they agree that they think that they should be in love with someone before having uh, sex with them, which alarms us because primarily the, <laughs> the requirement may be before you get engaged no, to sexual activity, you should no, get married, no, something like that. It should be uh, not only uh, in love. However, they generally agreed on that, that they believe that girls and boys should remain virgin until they get married. Uh, another, they disagreed that I am, they are confident that they can in, insist on the use of condom every time they have sex, uh, got 44%. With those results, we found that the adolescents have real sexuality and reproductive health issues that needs uh, to address. And of course, the implementation of the RH law is in place with programs on adolescent uh, is continuously supported by the government. Their perceptions about sexual activities and use of preventive measures on teenage pregnancy, STI, HIV is somewhat to intervene. And of course, uh, the involvement of young people in programs is highly recommended. And we found also there should be an establishment of a teen center in the university, which is also we found as significant as a counterpart of the university as to addressing this uh, adolescent health issues uh, that uh, the province would like to address. We also based on our putting up the, the center based on the current statistics in 2016 that there are indeed then get cases of teen uh, deliveries. HIV, AIDS infection, and even uh, cervical cancer. And we know the fact these are sexually related no, cases. And of course, the, the Young Adolescent Fertility Survey conducted in 2014, we found that 12.9% only of adolescents surveyed reported to use condoms in sexual activities. And the very reason also why they're increasing of HIV is men have sex with men 
you have the highest mode of transmission and even bisexual contact, which uh, alerted us or alarmed us that we should somehow intervene as a university, as one of the biggest university in the region that needs to address these ad adolescent health issues. So the focus of the center, the Divine Youth Health Center, we started in August 2016 you know, up to the present. And the main goal is actually to institutionalize this school-based program to create a diverse, affordable, and age-appropriate promotion of sex, sexuality, and productive health services to address health-related issues and problems of the youth, uh, aged 10, 20, 20, uh, 10 to 19 years old in Benguet province. So initial uh, partnership uh, with the Commission on Population and Development, we actually have a memorandum of agreement for them to assist us in the, in the development or the creation of the center. And they give us also initial funding. And of course, uh, in partnership with the Department of Health in the Cordillera Administrative Region, and even with the support of Provincial Health Office in Benguet. So there are five project objectives of this center. Uh, the provision of holistic and age appropriate sexual and reproductive health programs reach out to the less fortunate men and women and even out of school youth uh, to address misconceptions of health related issues, help out in the reduction of teen pregnancy in Benguet and in the Cordillera Administrative region, and also ensure a system of continuing education and development of the uh, youth, that even including the teachers and even the primary healthcare providers and workers and even peer educators and facilitators. And we wanted also to sustain this as a catchment facility hub or even a training center for primary health care services for local government units and teachers. So primarily the focus of this center is more on prevention programs. We're not providing uh, services as to HIV testing, even family planning, you know, because we don't have yet access to all of this. And of course, trainings are needed also before we could possibly provide these services. So we focus primarily on teaching the students. We were invited to several trainings. We were invited to several schools also in the region for us to facilitate their trainings. So this presentation will report only the salient findings and implications of the first phase evaluation that we conducted after three years implementation of the program. So since 2016, we conducted meetings and consultation with different stakeholders in the university. As I said earlier, there is a memorandum of agreement with the Commission on Population Development for the supervision and initial funding. So that was uh, 2016 to 2017. Uh, they also initiated the trainings of adolescents and even facilitators and peers because we wanted to uh, our students should be at least equipped to conduct peer trainings to their co-students or to their peers. However, after 2017, we found that there are students no, no, uh, after the trainings, after uh, we conducted also the peer trainings with some of the students, eventually they will graduate. And then the problem is we're not able to sustain the peer education program. So the focus only of the lectures of the adolescent sexuality and productive health, we are particular on the sexuality and RH, prevention of teen pregnancy, STI, HIV AIDS, and cervical cancer, which are approved also by the gender and development, which they funded these uh, lectures in the past three years. And of course, with the support of the Department of Health and the Commission on Population and Development. So we conducted the evaluation survey uh, in 2019 uh, with 66% females, 21% males, and 13% LGBTQ+. Uh, we consented and participated in the survey. So we used the modified, we modified the HEADS assessment scale. However, we use only or collected the sexuality and productive health part of the survey. We conducted also con document reviews, collect data, if there are indeed concerns about the program that we are implementing. So we found that there are successes 
we notice good practices of our program. There is uh, before there is no timely monitoring. Now there is a monitoring and recording of teen pregnancy cases because if you will uh, time and again we notice that there are teen pregnancies. However, we are not recording them. Uh, we don't know even the reason why the student uh, leave. Uh, they wanted to leave because we don't know that they are pregnant. So somehow this program helped our school clinics to facilitate the monitoring and recording of teen pregnancy. We also help in the distribution of information education campaign materials with the help of the Department of Health and PAPCOM. Before we don't have these materials, however, uh, with also the interest of this uh, partnership with other agencies, be able to contribute in terms of the distribution. And of course, we conducted peer education sessions among the students partly. So these are some pictures that we uh, conducted. Uh, we institutionalized the, the RH concerns among adolescents that focus on the three that I said earlier. It's more on the teen pregnancy prevention, HIV AIDS and cervical cancer because once you, uh, because we wanted to look at uh, the perspective of students that these three, once you're not able to protect yourself by using condom, somehow you will get all of this. You will get one or three of all of these uh, cases. You can get HIV, female tendency, they get pregnant. And of course, young adolescents tendency in the future, they will get cervical cancer. So we focus on these three to alarm them or to facilitate in terms of educating them to prevent sexually related, uh, sexually related uh, issues. So the adolescent and sexuality reproductive health topics were approved by the university. Uh, as I said, is it integrated in the national service training program because we wanted to sustain the program. So we focus only on the first year level or level one students in all the university programs. And these uh, were funded also by the Gender and Development Office. Uh, at least 12 RH infographics were developed with the peer educators to be used in the future RH activities because we wanted to sustain. Uh, we expect that there are only few materials that given from our partner agencies. That's why we produce also infographics. And of course, who facilitated the infographics training? It was actually funded by the PAPCOM. The program noticed significant marked decrease also in the two campuses in 2018, which uh, gave us also the impression that indeed, uh, with the prevention activities that we conducted with the help of the school nurses in those campuses, somehow it helps in the decrease or increase awareness in terms of the complications that they will, uh, they will uh, experience when they are pregnant as young as uh, still a student in our university. So these are some of the uh, materials that our students produce for a campaign. Uh, there are also series of uh, activities that we conducted in addition to those uh, lectures that we conducted to students. We celebrate also the Women's Month yearly and we conducted also cervical screening. Uh, some of our faculty trained to conduct the cervical screening and counseling for and forum on violence against women. However, in the survey that we conducted in 2019 to, to check on the awareness and knowledge of participants of our program, there are 42.6 42 claim they had the romantic relationship versus 10.4. So we were alarmed that there's still 10.4% uh, engaged in sexual relationship, despite of those uh, possible uh, complications that they will uh, experience, they will get pregnant early or get pregnant or they will get uh, SDHIV, those things. However, there is still 10.4% of the population uh, engaged in sexual relationship. It's also 72% of the participants reported not to use protection like condom if they claim that they are sexually active. And 77% claim we are comfortable of having early sex. 23%, 23 23.2% uh, felt pressured or uncomfortable also having sex. And interestingly, uh, there are 76% of the young population 
know about the contraception and protection against uh, HIV. So at least 76%. However, we wanted to be make it 100%, but based on the survey that we conducted in 2019, we found that we need more still efforts how, on, uh, on how we could possibly increase their awareness or knowledge in terms of preventing those sexually related problems. So moving forward, we plan, despite of the vast outreach and extension activities that we conducted about the adolescents RH issues challenging Filipino youth, uh, this is a proof of the commitment of Beckett State University in partnership with our uh, partner agencies on how to sustain this program. Uh, there will be intensive trainings, capacity building activities, and massive efforts of the program to all affected stakeholders are equally important to do both in the school and community. So these are initial uh, activities that we conducted based on the uh, survey that in partnership with the uh, Department of Education, we conducted the strategies in teaching STI HIV in school. So we invited uh, teachers who are teaching the MAPE program. The MAPE is music, arts, and health, or physical education and health teachers, because they are the one task actually to teach uh, health related topics in their classes. That's why we invited them to be trained on how we could possibly enhance their strategies in teaching STI HIV in school. And we also have these meetings with uh, some stakeholders in the province. So we call this as HIV AIDS Prevention Action Network. We recommend that there should be more investment to elementary and high school teachers in, in teaching adolescent sexuality reproductive health topics, but we need to explore like the comprehensive sexuality education, which until I think this year is not yet fully implemented by the Department of Education. Uh, so as I said, we have these HIV AIDS programs in the province of Benguet. So HIV training to high school teachers started in 20, 2019. There should be a continuous monitoring and evaluation of the program is recommended. And of course, there should be partnership with other line agencies that needs to be sustained. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jude, so much. That was very, very interesting. I'm not sure if you could hear people applauding because people have muted their microphones, but it was really fantastic. And, you know, I think in the discussions when we come back, uh, so many of the statistics that you put up there, the 75% decrease in adolescent pregnancies, as an example, the whole link between uh, comprehensive sexuality education and the HIV STA, STI education in schools, given across our region, that there's so many different challenges in having CSE in place, in having the education training program that you have in place. I think your positive example is one that will really be enormously important for, for people listening online and listening later to to drill down and to communicate with you to find out exactly more details on, on how you got those levels of successes. But really, thank you very, very much. It's such a fundamentally critical area of work in our region. Thank you, Jude. Thank you. I would, I would now like to turn to our second abstract um, presenters. We have two who are doing a joint presentation. Here we have Shamreen and Manisha Dakal. So Shamin is a, Shamreen is a feminist and a rights activist working on gender justice and bodily rights. And for the last eight years, she has been advocating for the promotion of sexual and reproductive health and rights in the region through public campaigning, community mobilization, and through human rights accountability of duty bearers absolutely fundamentally critical. She is currently managing the advocacy portfolio of the Asia Pacific Transgender Network, which many of us know as APTN. And she previously worked at the Asia Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, ARO, which we all know also, and Shirkat Ga Women's Resource Center. 
So Manisha, Manisha Dakal is a transgender woman and executive director of Blue Diamond Society and the president of the Federation of Sexual and Gender Minorities of Nepal. And Blue Diamond is so well known to all of us across Asia and the Pacific and around the world. She's also one of the founder members of the Asia Pacific Transgender Network and former co-chair of ILGA Asia Board and a board member of the R. Uh, the, sorry, the IRGT, the Global Network of Transgender Women and HIV. Nisha has been involved in Nepal's LGBT uh, rights movement since 2001 and was the first trans woman in the Nepal country coordinating mechanism of the Global Fund, which is an extraordinary achievement, you will all agree. She was awarded the Nairam Lakshmi National Award in 2010 for her contributions to the LGBTI movement in Nepal. And today, Samreen and Manisha will speak to us about integrating transgender health into HIV and SRHR programming in Indonesia, Nepal, Thailand, and Vietnam. You have the floor, Samreen and Manisha. Over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm really honored and, and glad to be presenting here um, in this session. Um, I will be presenting some key findings from our regional study, The Cost of Stigma, Understanding and Addressing Health Implications of Transphobia and Discrimination on Transgender and Gender Diverse People. Um, I my presentation will focus on how this research study was conducted. And I will also very briefly and quickly share some of the key regional findings and to my colleague Manisha will delve deeper into findings um, and learnings from Nepal. All right, so um, what are the objectives of, um, of this study? This study was conducted under the Key Population Research and Advocacy uh, Project. It's a global fund uh, project and APTN was one of the subrecipient. Um, and the study was conducted in collaboration with four country partners. Blue Diamond Society from Nepal um, was one of our country partners in Nepal. Um, we wanted to conduct uh, a community-led and community-inclusive research on barriers to accessing HIV and other healthcare services, including sexual health and general health care for trans people in Indonesia, Nepal, Thailand, and Vietnam. And our secondary objective for this study was to determine how to remove these barriers through community empowerment. Um, in terms of research methodology, it's a community-led research, as I mentioned earlier, and it was conducted in collaboration with um, uh, four uh, community-led organizations. So we have from Indonesia, GWL, from Nepal, we have Blue Diamond Society. In Thailand, our country implementing partner was Sisters Foundation. And in Vietnam, we conducted this research in collaboration with Vietnam Transgender Network with support of SCDI. Uh, we used a multifunction methodology, so community-based surveys, um, focus group discussions and key informant interviews were conducted. Um, we had 250 respondents to community-based service per country and a total of 996 trans individuals participated in the community-based service. We used a gender minority stress and resilience framework and we looked at uh, stresses that specifically are associated with, uh, with gender identity as an important driver of negative health outcomes for trans people. We also looked at decreased utilization of healthcare services due to mistrust in health system based on previous experiences of discriminations um, um, by healthcare providers. We also uh, looked at some potential st stresses not related to gender identity, such as the cost of treatment and distance from health facilities. And um, these were also important to um, look at as stresses because these can be potential reasons um, why trans people may or may not have access to particular healthcare services. And um, I, I should also highlight that this is the first primary research that has collected data on trans men. And through our research, we have aimed to reduce their invisibility within the community of trans people. So what are the key research findings? And I'll very, very briefly present um, some of the regional findings. My colleague Manisha will um, give more details um, at what, what, what is happening at country level. 
So we, we found through our research that most trans people across all countries were aware of sexually transmitted infections and HIV, and most had been tested for STIs and HIV at some point. We did have small number of HIV positive respondents in our community-based service, and nearly all of them were on ART. Sex workers were most likely tested for STIs across the three countries, with the exception of Vietnam. In Vietnam, we just didn't have enough sex worker respondents and we couldn't analyze the data for Vietnam. Um, in terms of um, access for STI treatments, community-based organizations were um, one of the most common sources for STI treatment. Trans women have higher testing uptake for STIs and HIV compared to trans men. And in Vietnam, interestingly, more trans men tested for STIs. Use of um, pre preventive treatments like PEP and PrEP were low across all four countries. And we also noticed that HIV status itself influences whether trans patients are refused treatment. So for instance, in Nepal, in Indonesia, they were, our re survey respondents were um, more likely to say that they had experienced gender minority stress and it, it potentially exacerbated because of discriminatory treatment related to being both transgender and HIV positive. And um, it also, this discrimination that they're experiencing in HIV care settings, it also led to delays in accessing general health care in Nepal and Indonesia. But interestingly, we did not find that trend in Thailand and Vietnam. Um, where do the critical gaps lie? So trans people's right to health is compromised across the region due to gaps in the availability of services. Um, discrimination and cost barriers undermine accessibility of services. And finally, ac acceptability issues were also um, found due to lack of guidance about providing quality services in a way which is culturally incompetent for trans people. Stigma and discrimination limited trans people's access to general health care services. Trans people living with HIV experience double stigmatization due to their HIV status and also due to their gender identity. We also um, found that trans people desperately need mental health ser support services um, and there is a, a urgent need for trans affirmative mental health care. There are gaps in sexual health services, including HIV prevention and treatment services for trans women. And we found that no services specifically targeted at trans men. Very important finding here. In terms of recommendations, so um, our recommendations focus broadly on, you know, on steps that health ministries, academics and policymakers and health providers and CBOs need to take. So very broadly, um, we, we recommend that discrimination and improving the responsiveness of healthcare services to trans people needs to be addressed urgently. Um, and significant information gaps about trans people's health should also be addressed through research and community-led studies. Um, to trans people's equal access to mental health services also needs to be ensured. Trans people's equal access to HIV and sexual health services also needs to be ensured. And finally, um, it, it's very critical to improve trans people's access to gender affirming care as well. So that's all from my end. I will now pass it to Manisha so she can present insights from the Nepal chapter of this study. Uh, thank you, Shamreen. Uh, I'm very honored to be here to share the findings of the KPR study. So I'm going to share the slide. Okay, uh, as uh, Samrin mentioned that uh, this project is community led and driven research project. So uh, we are transgender people from all four countries, Indonesia, uh, Nepal, Thailand, and Vietnam gathered in the regional workshop uh, to design the research agenda and the finalization of the a research questionnaire and the setting of the guideline of the, uh, you know, the uh, transgender research project questions and the key informant interview questions. So we gathered there and when we returned back to uh, our country, we uh, translated uh, those all uh, document in our uh, local language and the country context and we uh, started the research and we not only um, involved in the beginning in the planning, 
doing, but we also involve in the implementation part of the resource and the monitoring and evaluation of the resource. And after the resource, uh, we made some action uh, like, uh, you know, the uh, we uh, developed the action plan and we uh, developed the advocacy strategy and we implement uh, some advocacy intervention uh, to overcome the, uh, uh, you know, the some barriers that are formed in the research project. So, and uh, we recruit the, our community researchers in the uh, in this research project, and we uh, enhance the capacity of our community people. Now, in our organization in Blue Diamond Society, we have the uh, team of uh, community researchers, and we already completed one community research uh, after the KPRA. This is a very uh, good, uh, you know, the result of this project, and uh, we disseminate the findings of the research with the wider uh, stakeholders and the uh, advocacy implementation program after the research. And during this research uh, project, you know, we need to take the IRB approval uh, from the Nepal Health Research Council. So in this process also, we community people involved in the uh, research uh, project uh, to seek the, to take the uh, IRB approval. So now we enhance our capacity in the future that we can, uh, you know, the uh, start the process to uh, take the approval from the National Health Research Council independently in the future. And uh, this uh, project is not only the resource, but also the advocacy project. So we, uh, you know, the implement the advocacy intervention after the uh, findings of the resource. Uh, this resource was conducted in the two cities of Nepal, like in Nepal guns and the Kathmandu, and the respondent are the transgender men and transgender women. Uh, 250 uh, transgender person were interviewed, like uh, 67 uh, transgender men and 181 transgender women, and two are intersex and gender fluid person. And there was a five focus group discussion. This focus group discussions were uh, targeted for the uh, transgender who are sex worker, transgender men, trans transgender who uh, are HIV positive, transgender who are drug users, and then along with the key informant uh, stakeholders from the government agencies, uh, development partners, service providers, and the community leaders. Uh, the findings of this uh, KPRA research, it shows that, you know, the among the 200, uh, you know, the 50 respondent, 17 individuals who tested HIV positive, there were three uh, uh, people from the trans men community who said that they are tested positive. So uh, Blue Diamond Society implementing the, uh, you know, the uh, HIV intervention program, so long time focusing the transgender women, but this resource project shows that there is, uh, you know, the cases of HIV positive from the trans men also. So uh, this is, you know, the uh, suggestion for the community-based organization, organization like Blue Dem Society and the other development partner donors and the regional partners to work uh, and, uh, you know, the, to develop some, you know, the intervention for the transgender men also. Uh, and uh, in the IBBS study, in, uh, if we compare the IBBS study of HIV prevalence among the transgender women, it, uh, you know, the from 6.2% in 2015, it raised to 8.5% in 2017. So we need to, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, provide the uh, quality services uh, intervention program for the transgender community in the future because the prevalence rate is higher compared to the previous uh, IBBS study. While concerning the mental health issues, as somebody mentioned that there's a worse condition among the transgender uh, people on the mental health issues, uh, you know, the uh, Thirty-three percent of the uh, respondent thoughts about the ending their life, and there is average age of suicide attempts uh, is you know eighteen and half years. So, uh, you know, during the uh, lockdown, uh, during the COVID pandemic situation, so far we documented fifteen cases of suicide 
you know, within our community. These cases are uh, because of the, you know, the conflict between our gender identity and our family relationship issues, livelihood issues, and then frustration because of there is no law uh, and protection law. Um, these kind of, you know, the um, different barriers that uh, lead to the uh, worsen mental health issues among the transgender people and the most of the transgender people, we think that the hormone and the transitioning surgery, transitioning, uh, you know, the affirmation uh, services for the transgender people is very, very important. So uh, because of not having such kind of services, we seek those services uh, going to India and the Bangkok and other third country. And the uh, most of the transgender people, uh, we are using the hormone. Mm, uh, from the age of, you know, the average age of 22 years and the youngest one who uh, within this research project, we found that 15 years of young trans woman who started the hormone in her uh, 15 years of age. So uh, this hormone uses is uh, not monitored, not prescribed, and it's from, we are getting the hormone from the pharmacy. And compared to the trans woman, a trans men, uh, uses hormone, um, the compare rate is, you know, the 43% of the trans women are using hormone. Uh, in other hand, the only 7.5% of trans men are using hormone. This also shows one, you know, the concern that the uh, most of the transgender women are exposure in the community-based organization and they have opportunity, uh, exposure opportunity in the regional or international, uh, you know, the forum and that not uh, for the trans men, trans men are the less, uh, they have the less opportunity for the, this kind of exposure and they have less information on this kind of uh, hormone, uh, you know, the utilization. So uh, trans men are only during the research. This research is so that more trans women, they use the hormone compared to the trans men. And for the, you know, discrimination, assault and the violence, uh, among the respondent, 48 of the respondent had experienced serious assault and um, more sex workers are prone to this kind of, uh, you know, the assault compared to non-sex worker. Recently, uh, last week, uh, one of our friend, Nikki Sastrasta, she was harassed by the some guys and th those who harassed her, they make the video and they make the TikTok and they share the um, the harassment, you know, the video clips in the social media after they post in the social media, there's a flood of, you know, the condemning such kind of behavior and we get the support from the celebrities, government agency, police and the, you know, the social media users uh, and we condemn such kind of assault and the, you know, the discrimination. So there is a lot of things that need to be done to uh, end such kind of violence and the assault. And, uh, you know, the other uh, practical barriers uh, that uh, hinders accessing the uh, healthcare services, it is related to the cost and the transport and the clinic timings, uh, because, you know, the uh, transgender sex worker uh, more active in the nightlife. And then, uh, you know, the uh, we do the rest in the morning and the afternoon time and when we wake up and the clinic time has already gone. So uh, clinic timing is also important. Uh, clinic timings uh, is important to access the any kind of healthcare services and they due to the, uh, we don't have the, um, the service site in, all areas, so the so distance also matter and the transportation and the cost also matters uh, to access the healthcare services. And the other uh, findings are, you know, the healthcare services, uh, you know, are not inclusive. Uh, you know, the only the, uh, the community, uh, so far 25 community based organization, uh, we are providing the healthcare services, but these healthcare services are more on, you know, the uh, focus on HIV and STI is not for the uh, gender affirming uh, services and then uh, 
uh, you know, the hormonal counseling and there's some uh, information on hormone. So uh, it's not the inclusive one. We think that uh, HIV services should go alone, uh, should not go alone, but it's together with the human rights and other healthcare need of transgender people, but that is not happening. And the stigma and discrimination is always there when we go to the you know the hospitals and the healthcare services. The, the other people they laugh, they cheat, and they gather the other people. And because of that kind of attitude, it's very difficult to access the healthcare services. And then uh, I already mentioned that the 57.6 percent of the trans people who purchase hormone from the pharmacies, not, uh, you know, the seeking the, um, you know, the proper guidance and the counseling, the information from the healthcare providers and the mental health issues uh, services are lacking there and the um, no mechanism to address the violence and assault from the government. The, in the last UPR cycle in 2015, Nepal government received the uh, recommendation from the Spain that to set the mechanism to address the any kind of violence and discrimination towards our community, but the, that UPR recommendation is not implemented uh, yet. And then uh, most of the uh, community people uh, they rely on the community-based organization and peers, and 23.4% uh, did not seek help uh, from anyone because um, there is no any such mechanism set from the government and other institutions. And then uh, healthcare providers, they want to work with us, but they, there is less capacity for the gender identity. They need to enhance their capacity, but that is a gap, we found gap, uh, and this research shows that those gaps and then recommendation part you know the we all want to end the all forms of discrimination especially in the healthcare setting and the increasing uh, access of availability of HIV and healthcare service for transgender people but this um, how we can achieve this. Um, uh, th these are some uh, recommendations like investment, proper investment, adequate investment, and the focus investment is very, very important. And the policy change is also important because, uh, you know, the uh, uh, we we cannot do the sex reassignment surgery because of the policy barriers and uh, transgender people, they move to India and Bangkok to have such kind of, uh, you know, the this kind of uh, surgery, uh, surgery, and the recently Nepal government introduced a citizenship bill now discussing in the parliament, which requires the evidence uh, to amend the citizenship for the transgender people. For it's very. Uh, ridiculous because the, it's very difficult for us to invest in the sex reassignment surgery to amend to access our citizenship card. It's not from the uh, you know the self determination, but the that citizenship bill talk about the requirement of the uh, bill uh, requirement of uh, you know the medical proof to amend the citizenship card and then. Institutionalization is very much important. Uh, different stakeholders, they do the, uh, you know, the intervention for the transgender people, but we want institutionalization. We want inclusion in their policy. We want inclusion in their strategy. We want uh, their uh, change mentality and attitude attitude to provide the services for the transgender people and for this purpose obviously um, there should be enhancement of their capacity to understand the gender identity gender expression are our issues and the uh, integrated trans health inclusive uh, you know the services is very much important uh, recently we have uh, discussed with the um, uh, discussed with the FHI uh, to integrate the HIV program with the trans health needs we are uh, soon setting up the you know the clinic with the uh, medical health expert to provide the healthcare uh, you know the hormonal uh, information towards the transgender people that is very good sign after this research dissemination we discussed with 
the FHI team and we are in the in that process and the scale up of mental health services is very much important and the, the strengthening the community and peer led transgender group is very very much important because we want quality services transparency and accountability of the government and non government led health services uh, because we want to involve not only in the planning process but also in the monitoring of the whole intervention. And then, uh, as I mentioned that uh, this is uh, also the resource pro, uh, advocacy project, we, uh, at, with support from the Asia Pacific Transcendent Network and the Blue Diamond Society, we submitted the, the Universal Periodic Review Report in the third cycle of Nepal UPR that is happening in 2021 in January. We include the findings of this resource project and we translated trans health through uh, print facts it in Nepali language and disseminated in our community. And the, we disseminated the findings of this resource and we support from the APTN and ELGA and other stakeholders uh, for to uh, support the, our community for the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, we conducted the uh, workshop in six provinces of Nepal and 22 our local level CBOs independently organized advocacy meeting with the local stakeholders. So this is the advocacy action within the process, but who want to go beyond of this project. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, please ask to me. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you so much, Manisha, and to Samreen. Um, really interesting. Um, colleagues, I know we're taking a little longer with um, in, in getting through the agenda, and, and I apologize, and, and it's my responsibility as the chair to speed everything up, but the, the presentations have been so fascinating. It will cut into our discussion time at the end, um, and I apologize for that, and really encourage you to use the chat box. Um, as a facility, as, as many of you are doing. But it's really so critical to listen to the communities. And I love this whole community-led research approach, um, particularly in the area of transgender health and, and rights. Um, it's an area that still requires a lot more direct community-led research. So thank you, Samreen, and to Manisha for that very insightful presentation. Our next abstract and um, presenter is Dr. Hajjad Kosha. And, and Hajjad is currently working as a capacity building specialist at the YR Getonde Center for AIDS Research and Education in India. Previously, she worked for the India HIV AIDS Alliance for nearly a decade very, very famous institution, if ever there was one. A resilient feminist and an uh, HIV TB community advocate, Hajat has spent nearly two decades um, managing programs centered on key populations and core communities in India, while working closely with national health programs and community networks. She has coordinated dynamically with women who use drugs, with sex workers, transgender people, young people, and people from uh, communities of people living with HIV to strengthen aspects of TB and HIV care, support, prevention, sexual reproductive health and mental health programs, which is absolutely fantastic. So today, Hajat is going to speak to us on stigma, sex work and non-disclosure to healthcare providers, exploring dynamics of anal sex, through community-led monitoring to build gaps in HIV care and continuum of services. Hajat, the floor is yours and I implore you to maintain the time. Thank you so much, Hajat, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Jennifer. And uh, I, I'm really happy to be here. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, really like uh, I was going is watching and listening our previous presentations and uh, I think this is falling right in place and I want to also mention that what uh, you know uh, Eamon you know started and talking about access so why we are here talking about uh, my presentation I want to begin the give a background to it that what is more important when we are talking about healthcare services 
access is very important you know it is definitely but quality of services like access to quality of healthcare services that is you know paramount we should we are all trying and striving to get that also it's not uh, access alone will not uh, you know help us we also need availability of quality services we also need a regular engagement from communities where communities can come to a platform and tell that we want this service we don't want this this is this is like uh, we want it this way or you know and to complement that we need to have um, a regular availability of services like you know there are no stock outs what my other friends were also talking during their presentations so with all these things you know we are here today and uh, so i'm going to talk about like how we bring together our communities how we bring together healthcare providers and uh, community engagement is important but what we need to do is community monitoring so i believe community monitoring accountability is very 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 important and uh, with our current you know if you look at south asia programs how we are like you know our programs are wonderful but how are we you know looking at the how are we monitoring what is the community's perspective on the programs on availability of services and how we can make them better better for ours better for us better for the communities so the discussion here is like how when you bring into the focus like tools of uh, community accountability or community monitoring how it empowers communities you know like uh, so today i'm going to talk about uh, how when we started developing community scorecards it helped us to understand that anal stis among women who who are in sex work is completely neglected no one is talking about it communities are not coming ahead you know women are like uh, scared they go to private providers but they are not going to regular public sector or they are not talking about it so this was this came as a shocker like uh, when we started discussing with women that how are the services and i will walk through the process of the developing the scorecard but when we started talking with women that how are the services you are taking services are very good fantastic doctors are completely sensitized towards uh, women in sex work towards plhiv communities okay okay then is there anything more you want so some uh, you know there were some friends from uh, msm community they started talking that yes lube should be made available in government sector in india you know it's not uh, hiv prevention programs are not able to get it so then this discussion started on anal stis how it's happening and then some women started talking oh my doctor never checked me why because there has been no discussion about it because uh, you know there are so many moral conflicts that the women transgenders you know we don't have anal sex so though nobody is talking about it so that's how this thing came up then women went to the healthcare providers they discussed that we want that can you do this so the, even the healthcare providers were little um they were like skeptical that no one has come to them and uh, these are we are talking about some rural areas and all so then how the sensitization happened how communities spoke to healthcare providers and how they started getting you know examinations done for anal sti and how it all developed you know so this was a beautiful process but it was only possible because communities were empowered during the process of developing scorecards so what is a scorecard basically it's very simple it's like local problems have local solutions like you don't need to sit down and write uh, long emails about you know i am not uh, getting uh, this service at this center go talk to the healthcare providers talk to the government hiv prevention program representatives talk to community leaders get everyone involved and resolve it there and then so that is how this approach developed so so it is basically a very uh, like um, community scorecard is a very beautiful process in which communities healthcare providers hiv prevention program like uh, like ti we call it in india 
and also the government stakeholders and other stakeholders get involved everyone come together so how it you know started like we are talking about actual services you know which are being delivered we are not talking like uh, we are talking about uh, is the timings when you go to get your art medicine suitable for you or okay the hospital is getting closed at 1 pm every day and uh, i am a sex worker i can only go in the afternoon okay those were the discussions then also like at one place they were like so much uh, you know we we had discussions with communities and community said that we are not getting good counseling services you know our sti counselor doesn't even talk about stis she just talks about go take medicine did you get yourself examined there is no discussions and then when we went to the healthcare providers and discussed that sti counselor just stood up herself and she said i am the counselor for hiv testing the position for sti counselor is vacant for last two years the, they are not doing anything even i don't understand why i have to do so then discussions happen and within one month there was a new sti counselor so these are some of the achievements which i feel really we really need when we have such large scale programs so what is a scorecard let me come back to that so it is a process in which scoring is done on set of services by first by communities then by healthcare providers same same tool and then all of them sit together um, communities healthcare providers government prevention program representatives community leaders and examine the scores what both have given draw out a mutual action plan and then work together to achieve that action plan and have a regular quarterly meeting so that it's a ongoing process yeah it is a sustainable mechanism because once you have these meetings happening then you know whether a program is there or a funder is there the it can be sustained so that's why it is so important then what were the features of the scorecard so this example which i am giving it was uh, developed under a cbc supported grant called nirantar which was uh, implemented by alliance india so i have taken this example from there so community in that scorecard there were seven set of indicators so first indicators were on the quality of services if if you are getting uh, is the counseling good when you go there is every time you're getting enough time to talk about your problems or is it just like a group counseling where 10 people are sitting together and uh, you know counselor just tells everyone you are going for hiv test just sign on the forms it has happened in some places but we you know ask them what do you think so then uh, on one point all community members will say oh when i went to the counselor she was very nice i want to give her an 8 other one when i went her she just gave me a minute i just want to give her a two then they discuss among themselves and they give you know uh, mutually agreed scores okay on the quality of counseling at our uh, hiv testing center we want to give it a five okay fine and what is the reason we note down the reason so similarly this tool was done with the healthcare providers what do you think at your center so it in a room there is no one from the community only healthcare providers from the doorman to the head of the department from physicians to nurses to lab staff to opd staff so then everybody's like how much, how do you think are the counseling services and the counselors like oh we are very good we are we attend everyone and anybody who comes to us our doctor here is very good we sit with them and then suddenly what the gatekeeper says that i am also very good at my job i just don't let transgender women enter the hospital because they come in and then they create noise and everybody was like silent for a moment that oh my god what is happening here so that is how the, then the hospital themselves said okay you give it a two this time and in next quarter we will improve we will send we will sensitize everyone and we will all make our you know facility more um open and uh, stigma free so that is how it started it was repeated on a quarterly basis however at some places now if you see i've seen some other scorecards it can be done on monthly basis if it's lot of a uh, lot of uh, you know centers are there we can do it at six monthly basis also so this is the entire uh, 
framework of the scorecard. So scoring is between zero to 10, and you have indicators which are on access to services, HIV related stigma, and on health facility level. Okay, do you think uh, when you go there, you know, when you're waiting, how do you spend your waiting time? Actually, we don't spend, we don't do anything. There is nothing on the walls. Then they said, we need some IEC material. And when we went to the healthcare providers, they said, no, we have posters stuck on our entire facility. And when we had the final meeting, then they said they have put the poster so high to cover the leakages in the wall that community members sitting downstairs cannot even read them. Please bring them down. So these kind of little, little changes happen, but it really helped you know, communities to know what are the services existing, how, do, how they can access them. And even the healthcare providers were very, very supportive. They wanted services to be more accessible, available, and these little changes were made. So after the scoring is being done, if a score is getting eight, uh, if an indicator is getting eight to 10 points, we also congratulated healthcare providers. But if the scorings were less than four, we made it an action point and we checked it out, you know, how the scores improved over a period of three months. And then action plan was drawn. And this action plan had clear things like who is going to do what? Like, is the problem at healthcare provider level, at HIV prevention program level, at government level, or even at communities level? Like, at some points, there was a discussion that, you know, when community people are coming, they're not disclosing that they are coming from a TI. So we had a discussion that why are you not disclosing that you're coming from HIV prevention program? So they're like, the moment I take the slip <clears throat> of a HIV program, you know, I, I start getting, you know, people start calling me names, even the lab assistant, even the counselor, they say, oh, they have come. So she's like, that's why I don't want to, you know, uh, tell that I'm coming from a prevention program. Then we had a difference. So we had an indicator on this also. Do you think healthcare providers gossip about you? Or do you think that when you go, you are being you know, discriminated? So these were small, small changes and then we moved ahead on it. So it is a continuous process. You need to have, um, you know, whether they are getting services, they are poor or not getting, or they are denied of services. Or uh, like when we <clears throat> discussed about anal STI, it was initially, nobody was talking about it. Then, you know, community started talking, but healthcare providers were not comfortable. When healthcare providers became comfortable, there were some moral discussions and all, and they started, you know, um, giving some counseling sessions to sex worker about health. So it was a long way. It was very, I would say, uh, uh, it took, there was a lot of stigma, which was not, you know, it was internalized stigma also in communities, which we were able to, you know, work on, but we need such processes so that we actually get to the actual problems or the little things we are missing out in our HIV programs. So interface meeting, which I told you, it's an amazing thing in which community members, healthcare providers, government, uh, HIV prevention programs, community leaders, everybody come interface to each other and they discuss what are the action points, how they want to be mitigated. And also in this afternoon interface meeting, we asked one of the one women, like, what do you think of this interface meeting? She's like, every time I used to sit outside, you know, this uh, senior medical officer's room, it's the first time I'm sitting face to face with him on the table and telling him that I want to be treated for anal STI. So it is an empowering experience altogether and very transparent and very like initially I used to think that developing support cards will make healthcare providers not happy. They will think that we are monitoring them, but they also understood we are not monitoring healthcare providers or government officials. We are just monitoring services. We are ensuring all services are available, accessible, and we are getting quality services. So these were some of the dashboards developed in that program, wherein around 1,526 key population members and 466 healthcare providers were engaged and 72 scorecards were developed. On the right-hand side, you can see how an advocacy tracker works. Like there are issues 
which issue is at which level was it as a counselor level community level um, healthcare providers level or whether it at government level so this is how it was monitored over a period of what do you call it a gap of 3 3 months then you know how so we were able to resolve 169 issues out of the 230 so first and foremost issue was when we worked with women in sex work sti issues were seldom discussed you know they were like we want to have services but there should be discussion on sti people should be open to talk about it and no one examined so that's how these issues came into place and we were able to discuss and resolve them so what were the challenges so cha there were a lot of challenges like at macro level we need healthcare providers to understand that we are not monitoring them we are just monitoring services and they need to be involved and it has to be time bound like if you have committed that we will be working on these services or we will be ensuring that these issues will be resolved then those action needs to be taken community members need to go regularly and follow up and even healthcare providers should be responsible so and we were able to achieve this also we need to uh, capacitate communities like what all services are available and the government is giving free of cost art and hiv prevention is not only about condom distribution so talking about prep and uh, you know talking about sti medicines uh, cervical cancer screening for young sex workers you know how do they making them you know capacitate them with negotiation skills you know so it is an it is a process you have to start by telling communities what are the services what are their rights how they can access them and then this process starts so just to sum it up in all what when we come to such little little needs when we are working with women in sex work still we are not prepared we are not prepared socially we have some cultural barriers in south asia particularly in india and uh, however if community monitoring systems are established you know and so communities will be engaged on regular basis at each and every point and then that is one step where we can make our services more accessible available and quality of services will be developed and simultaneously most important thing we will be able to overcome stigma and discrimination so thank you that was all from my side thank you so much please let me know if you have any questions thank you thank you so much harsha that was absolutely tremendous really really great job And thank you, Nix. You're doing a fantastic job as 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 an interpreter. <laughs> yes, thank you. It was so interesting, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. But really, congratulations because the whole area of anal health discussions are discussions that that we don't have, and yet again, it's among key populations where we have to have that discussion. Yet again, they have to be the forefront and the the forebearers of of trying to improve. what should be a part of health service delivery and sexual reproductive health service delivery everywhere so really thank you so much congratulations and the whole concept of the community scorecard absolutely terrific it's replicable everywhere and i love the way that you said the interface meeting was just so important so really i hope there's lots of discussion virtually in the chat and beyond this session because it's just really pioneering work and fantastic really thank you thank you so much and thank you thank you bobby and shobha and thank you so much for the session yeah so we're now going to our fourth um abstract presenters we have angela kenny hanku and agnes mek um agnes is having difficulty with connectivity so angela will present but i just want to stress it is actually a joint presentation from both agnes and from angela You can see Agnes on your screen first. So Agnes is the section head of social and behavioral research within the sexual and reproductive health unit in the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research. She is a social scientist and has conducted community-based research studies in partnership with young people and marginalized populations such as people living with HIV and people affected by resource extraction and how absolutely extraordinarily interesting 
that is to listen to. And then Angela, who's my friend, Angela Kelly Hanku is head of Section and Reproductive Health, also at the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research and a scientist. I find that very hard word to say, scientia. I tried, I failed. Associate Professor at the Kirby Institute in University of New South Wales in Sydney. She's also a social scientist and a public health specialist who has published extensively on the social research pertaining to health and development in Papua New Guinea. And today they're going to speak about I can, I want, I will, and young and positive. Two visual method projects of young women living with HIV in Papua New Guinea. Over to you, Angela and Agnes, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Jenny. Um, before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge Agnes Meck, who I think is online, but is not having good enough connectivity to present today of our collaborative work. Today I'm presenting to you from the UN Nation in, Papua New in Australia, and I'd like to acknowledge them as the traditional owners from where I am, and also acknowledge elders past and present, and any Indigenous people on this call today. The history of HIV is a multifaceted and incredibly rich one. One story of this history focuses on tremendous advancements made in biomedicine and the development of antiretroviral therapies to save the lives of people with HIV and re more recently reapplied to prevent affection in others. Microbicides, vaginal rings and vaccines are part of this unique biomedical story that have shaped our epidemic. But there are other histories. The story of HIV, at least particularly in the first two decades, was intricately entwined with the story of art and vice versa. Unable to save the lives in the way equitable and early access to treatment of infection can, art provides us an important vehicle to deliver messages of science while questioning inequalities and injustices and the social and political structures that breed fear, loathing and stigma. It can also decolonize our approach to HIV. There were individuals and artists and photographers like the Robert Maplethorpes and Sunil Gupta. There were collective art-based mem memorials in the name of the, name, the Names AIDS Project quilt. There were songs and quartets written and performed and there were films including Yesterday and Holding the Man, a cinematic rendition of the book of the same title. There are countless examples, probably some much better than we've used here, to illustrate the point. But like art itself, there are some that have resonated more with us than others. Arts-based research is the focus of our presentation today. And it's increasingly recognised and utilised as a means by which to collect and analyze data, as well as to disseminate key findings in emotionally evocative ways, culturally relevant ways, and ways which can empower and therefore speak to larger issues of colonization of knowledge and dis dissemination. As a group, we've used art-based research from the outset. Agnes and I first started playing with drawings with people living with HIV in 2007. Then we used photography with photo voice, body mapping, and more recently, filmmaking. You can see here on the left, a photo book using photo voice that's been entitled, I want, I can, I will. This was named from the stories three of the young women shared. To the right is the DVD cover of our documentary film series of three young Papua New Guinea and women living with HIV. And these stories, as Eamon reflected on in the beginning of this seminar today, really show the issues of solidarity and intersectionality between HIV and sexual and reproductive rights. And in PNG, where 26% of HIV exposed babies are infected, this is pertinent at this time. Each of these projects are art-based. They draw attention to the human face, 
the face of women and girls in the Pacific, and they raise pertinent issues that they courageously face. Each of these projects shares similar methodological elements, but has different purposes underpinning the creative and the intellectual process and their reach. Photography has been, an, has been important in the activist response to HIV. The major international exhibition, Positive Lives, has been instrumental in creating a truly global story of HIV by creating narratives of people with HIV and their families across the globe. These images are from one story in Australia almost 20 years ago that has remained a pertinent and ongoing feature of that exhibition. But photo voice is different to mainstream photography in a really important way. Rather than being the object of the story through the lens in the control of the hands of the photographer, photo voice challenges the power differentials and places the power of the story and the camera quite literally in the hands of the person, in our case, living with HIV. Through a workshop that Agnes led with over five days, we brought together young women who created their stories that most resonated with themselves and with each other. Our young people with HIV were active in the creation of their images and the stories that they wanted to have told about themselves. This approach to arts-based research draws on the long and respected and treasured work of the Brazilian educator Paulo Freire and his work on building critical consciousness. The critical process is illustrated best by this cyclical process, one that we engaged with with the young women over five days. I can't want, I can, I will became how we called our work. And we brought together nine young women and girls under the age of 24 who were living with HIV. Most had never connected with another woman or a girl with HIV. It became a really important opportunity for us to build a community of support and a community of solidarity. We were fortunate to recruit three older women living with HIV who had either been infected or had diagnosed as a young woman or even as an adolescent. This was the first project in PNG for and about positive women. It was based in Port Moresby and it was part of a larger mixed method study of the review of prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV and the loss to follow up. So what did the young women and the girls say to us? They spoke to us about the emotional distress of testing for HIV. They spoke about the rupture and return of family. They spoke about unplanned pregnancy and being tested during pregnancy. They talked about failed relationships with their family, with their boyfriends, with their healthcare workers. They spoke about needing to earn money and fit in with their peers. But they also spoke of hope. They spoke of getting married in the future, of having children. And for one young woman, the idea of returning to school and being able to learn was her hope. And in all of this, we learned of the centrality of treatments to their lives now, but also their capacity to have hope for the future. Unfortunately, we can't show you all the images, but just bear with me while I take you through some. In this image, Katie speaks the darkness she experienced of being like the shoes, discarded and left to die, to burn at the bottom of a fireplace. She felt alone and in the dark. She'd never felt this before. But in this darkness, she found hope and support from her mother and she commenced treatment. And with the help of her mother, who took her back to the hospital, to treatment and ultimately life, she talks about feeling clear and light and that treatment has become a friend. Having felt sick and suicidal, 
Dorothy began to treatment, began to take treatment and her life changed dramatically. She became stronger and healthier. ART is like a brick wall that protects her. It protects herself from co-infections, but now it protects her husband from becoming infected with HIV. And it's enabled her to have two HIV negative babies. The child on this wall, on this cement wall that's st sturdy and strong is guiding her and protecting her. And she hopes that it, along this path, at some point, she will see her grandchildren. Living with chronic diarrhea, poor cognitive function, the signs of early dementia and feeling weak, Demaria was tested for HIV. She was very ill. All she could say to the nurse was thank you. She couldn't rutter anything else. She suffered terribly at school. Friends wouldn't eat with her. They didn't want her to sit or chat with her. They said, don't stay and sit. And their gossip and unkind attacks and their unfriendly stares caused her to withdraw from school. She asks the pertinent question, with whom would I now crack jokes and enjoy friendship with? In time, she has started to take treatment and she feels she has a future. And she says, I am thinking that I can go back to school and I can learn again. The three, three documentary films that we did were rather different in the sense that it was less about creating a sense of community, self-reflection, action and critical consciousness. But these were stories still of triumph over adversity, of being diagnosed with HIV and TB during pregnancy, of finding support in healthcare workers, of the strength of the human spirit, of love, of family and of children and of learning to take treatment to continue living. These films have been distributed widely in Papua New Guinea, including to university libraries, to HIV clinics and networks of positive people. The films are on the YouTube of the PNG Institute of Medical Research, the first time we ever needed a YouTube channel. One of these films of a young woman called Maria has been viewed more than 3,000 times. Maria lives in a rural, remote village without running water and without power. And we went with her and her community to her local ART support centre to launch it. They created a huge feast and were so excited to see that a young woman from their village was being taken to the stage and her story as a woman with HIV was being heard. Earlier this year, Oxfam PNG even watched these films in Goroka as part of its International Women's Day. Here I want to show you just part of Maria's story. Tani girl made me to start. Me plus I will give money. Na me married to will give money. Na will give mouse water, mouse water. Me sa kari mo loge ta bro bro. Plus on pasi mo start. Me sa go will give money one day mo. Me sa will give money one Before <laughs> I want to send him up meeting Mosemica. Meeting Mosena, Mikolo Casam, Ossia, White House. Ah, Miba was taking Mikolo Casam, Ossia, White House. Taking blood and Old Em Togosem. Miko wanted to talk to him, taking blood and story, Miss Pinistam, taking blood and Old Em Togosem. Doctor Manantos, Miss Penuan Plastic, 
I've been very conscious of time um, today, so I'm sorry I couldn't share any more of that video or of the images with you. But we hope we have shown you that using visual methods with young women and girls offers us an enormous opportunity to hear the stories and see them in new and different ways. Positioned somewhat differently from each of them, these visual verbal narratives tell us of the role of treatment, that through treatment, particularly lifetime adherence to these treatment, each of these women and girls have been able to achieve what may be best described as universally small but personally profound milestones. An HIV negative baby, a boyfriend, getting married, completing their education, staying healthy, returning to treatment and remaining adherent. Adherence to these life-saving medicines has enabled each of these girls and women to imagine a future, a future that they are part of. Not only are they alive, but they are thriving. By themselves, these images, stories and films are just that. But when viewed in relationship to one another, important and resounding tapestry is woven with threads of endurance, of hope and of resilience. These visual methods brought to life the pains, the anguish, the fear, the pleasure, the love, the strength, the hope and the commitment that these young girls and women have living with HIV in PNG. And they offer hope to still much younger girls who are being diagnosed every day. They are proof that wants, cans and wills are possible. The stories in these projects are a call to action, a call to prevent other young girls and women in PNG and beyond from being infected with HIV and having access to supportive and preventative services. It's a call to action we cannot ignore. It's a call to ensure that all young girls live with rather than die from HIV. For other young girls and women, these stories are a call for solidarity, a call to say that you are not alone and together with us, you too can live with HIV. It raises important issues of intersectionality, as Eamon said in his opening remarks, around the need to integrate HIV and sexual and reproductive health. While all research methods have their place in the response, visual methods like those we have discussed here offer a unique opportunity to connect the head and the heart, to glean data and findings while at the same time evoking an intimate visceral response. Importantly, as we did this work with young girls and women, Agnes was with flooded by young men and boys with HIV who asked if we could do work with them as well. We cannot forget the boys. There is certainly an interest and a need for more art-based research on matters of HIV and wider sexual and reproductive health and justice in our region. And together, Agnes and I look forward to pursuing more and hopefully in partnership with many of you here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela and Agnes. That was really, really, really fabulous very powerful and i'm sure everybody listening online and who will review this later on will agree the power of art as you've shown it to tell the story to to have people speaking their lives for themselves i love the concept of colonization of knowledge and the use of emotion as a means of really conveying what is happening to people. We're now at the end of, of our fantastic presentations and our wonderful keynote speech. I've been absolutely hopeless at managing time and I should apologize. 
I apologize for my own, <laughs> my own limitations, but I would like to say though, that this is an important opportunity for us to come together to listen and to learn and to share. And yes, we have gone a little bit over time, but it's been so powerful and so worthwhile. And if you all reflect back on the whole range and gamut of issues that we've discussed, a few of the things that came out to me, and I'll be very brief, the importance of that community voice, the importance of having community led approaches to research, to art, to telling the story, to provide that narrative where communities are empowered to, to run their own services and to shape the services that they receive from others. You know, access to, to essential SRHR package of services and to HIV services has long been considered by many of us as a basic right. And yet here we are in November 2020, still arguing the case of HIV SRHR integration, something we thought that we had ahead of us solved 15 years ago, where we're still looking at stigma, discrimination, exclusion. We're still looking at the need to continue to train healthcare workers to, to really treat everybody with the, the rights and dignity that, that they deserve. It's a telling lesson to us, the number across all of the presentations of the issues around mental health. And for all the darkness that COVID-19 is bringing, it is shining a light on mental health. And you think about it, we've heard of emotional distress. We've heard of suicide ideation. We've heard of feelings of rejection, of inability to cope of not having choice, of not feeling empowered to make decisions over our own lives. This is why these series are so critical and why it's incumbent on all of us who work in HIV, who work in SRHR, who work in the areas of adolescence and youth, who work in the areas of art. You know, uh, we have uh, with us here Swapna, um, Mam Jumdar, who's a fantastic journalist in, in India, telling those stories, getting those stories out are really crucial for all of us. So I would like all of you to please join me in really warmly, loudly applauding, not just the presenters for their presentation today, but for work that they have done over decades, for the ways that they are contributing to changing and shaping the lives of communities, of key populations, people living with affected by HIV and transforming systems so that people can live their lives in dignity because I'm extremely proud of all of you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to, as we applaud, hand over to, to Shoba to conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Well, so well said, Jennifer. And now we move on to the open session. Uh, and participants, please keep on sending in your questions. We already have lot many questions with us. Uh, the first question is for Eamon uh, from a journalist from India. Thanks for a very insightful plenary, Eamon. And as health system strengthening is key to the response to the, to the pandemics like COVID-19 and even to specific diseases, do you think multi-sectoral response to end AIDS will get more traction politically in the Asia Pacific region when new HIV infections have plateaued for quite some time? Uh, thanks, Shobna, and thanks for the question. The immediate impact of COVID is to see a, a reduction of uh, programming for many other health issues, um, including HIV. So there's been a a short-term immediate impact. I think a number of governments have, have recognised the strength, particularly that health system strengthening aspect that you referred to, um, that's come from HIV as a model. And, and so that has been applied in their responses to COVID. Uh, as we go forward, the, the challenge is to get governments to now recognise that the new epidemics that are occurring in a number of countries could happen in any country, including India, where your journalist is from. 
And that'll take new and renewed political leadership. That's going to be the challenge for us in 2021, because no country is really going to meet the targets um, uh, of 2020 and 2030. There will be a new high level meeting to set renewed commitments uh, on the response to HIV. And like COVID, you know, we can't solve this unless everyone is accessing the support and the needs, um, uh, the care needs, um, prevention and treatment that is required. So this is going to be a challenge, not just for HIV, but COVID is here with us for the next couple of years. We need to look at how we bring the, the resources together because it's going to create increased strains on the health systems in many of the countries in our regions. Um, but political leadership for the response to HIV for the next period is going to be there uh, next year. Australia will co-chair with Namibia the high level meeting, just like countries in this region participated in, in the first in 2001. We're going to need to see that stepped up political commitment to make the real commitments um, uh, be put in place towards 2030, both the SDGs and, and HIV and sexual reproductive health. Back to you, Shobna. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Polly Kabir, who is program coordinator at Cook's Island National Council of Women. And the question is for Jude. Uh, and Polly wants to know if the center has access to contraceptives, is there any barrier in delivering the service at your center? Ah, oh, okay. Uh, we're not distributing yet contraceptives like condom. Uh, we attempt to distribute in 2016 condoms. However, the Office of Student Services, uh, I'm not sure if this is still a stigma or uh, somewhat uh, problems as to their uh, conservative uh, or the culture in our university. So we stop in terms of uh, distributing condoms that, that, that year and eventually in 2017 what we focus more on educating them uh, we just use those condoms for as a sample or demonstration uh, for them to uh, for them to be at least equipped in terms of using condoms once they want to engage in any sexual activity okay thank you there's one more question for you jude uh, while nurses have played a sterling role in the pandemic response and, but they were also contracting COVID uh, infection uh, in the process. Yes, yes. Do you see this as an opportunity to call for better staffing and support for nurses? Uh, I think so. Uh, the government is responding as to this concern. Uh, even the Philippine Nurses Association, our lead organization in the Philippines are doing their best also, uh, responding on the uh, staffing, good staffing, and of course the, the salary the mm. the salary that should <laughs> nurses should deserve, no, especially this time of uh, it's actually an eye opening to everyone in terms of uh, compromise uh, uh, benefits of health workers in the Philippines. And as of uh, recently, the president actually lifted in terms of uh, nurses going abroad. But maybe this is not uh, the right solution as of the moment. But actually, to increase uh, salary and of course good staffing that should be the focus. Uh, nowadays. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a question for Harjot from Swapna Majumdar. Uh, Jenny has already uh, said about Swapna. She is a very senior journalist from India, and uh, Swapna wants to know uh, that I am wondering, as a journalist, uh, Doctor Harjot, how you managed to the get the government on board? Yes. So yeah, thank you, Swapna. I responded also, and uh, it was like the process of. See, uh, what I experienced that you cannot have uh, communities at the end of the process. So what, am I audible, clear? Yes, yeah. very clear, yes. So what helped was engaging communities from the beginning. As we were developing the scorecard, you know, we had community consultations at first level, second level. So even each and every indicator came out of the you know, field realities or what communities experience and how the questions even need to be asked. Do you think healthcare providers gossip about you? Do you think that um, you know, availability of, uh, do you know about your rights in the HIV AIDS Act? So questions came from community consultations, then it was pilot tested. And then when we were going to healthcare providers, we had community leaders with us to talk why we want to have a transparent process. And it is not a blame game. 
it is like sitting on one table talking about you know what communities want and what healthcare providers also want they also want that you know services are there communities are getting quality services so what are the barriers we need to work together and build a common understanding and a common platform so it really helped you know by you know having communities not at the end but throughout the process it really helped us yeah thank you uh, we have a question from ervina uh, for samreen and uh, ervina says congratulations on your relentless and brave resolve of for recognizing gender minorities and how has the cultural background of the countries responded or reacted to your study where re recognition of trans men was highlighted um thank you i've responded in the comments as well um just a, a it, it was a very encouraging response very positive response because i think there is greater recognition of um you know the need to include trans men in in all of these researches especially because of their prevalent invisibility in existing data um so yeah it was um it, it was a very positive response that we received and also we, we received very critical insights for advocacy and um our campaigning related work okay thank you i'm just requesting the presenters to even when they have responded via chat i'm requested i'm requesting them to uh, speak out their answers because this is being uh, uh, uh tele uh, live streamed on facebook also and the recording will go up also so we would like to have everything uh, uh, verbally also so sorry for that you have replied but uh, it's good to let others know as well uh, now we have a question from rudy lopes also samreen for you that where did the remaining 40% of trans people receive their hormonal uh, medication yeah so it was from unregulated and non medical sources so um as you can see there is a very significant number of people who are still are uh, relying on um non medical and unregulated sources for access to hormones which is a problem uh, all right all right thank you and also were there any uh, uh, any uh, country uh, rather good country best country example of the four countries you have your study is based on any best practice example you found uh, so more for, yes. for both thailand and nepal um there were some really good uh, best practices that we found um and one uh, resilient factor that we found very strongly was um you know affiliation with community based organizations and the role trans led and um trans inclusive community based organizations have in enabling access to healthcare services um so that that's another you know there's a need to strengthen those organizations and there is a need to invest in those organizations all right thank you uh then we have a question um uh again from swapna that did you did your study explore awareness of the self testing hiv kits a uh, kits introduced by the vietnam ministry of public health uh, because the biggest advantage of the self testing kit is that it is private convenient and if the result is positive there is no one to pass any moral judgments um no so we didn't specifically included um this self uh, self test kit in our questions but i think it's a very interesting uh, point that you have highlighted and definitely something to consider for future um uh, future research all right thank you and we have had the many uh, comments for uh, presentation of for, of angela and agnes very powerful very insightful stories and thanks to both of you there have been many many Uh, commendable comments uh, for that presentation and last of all we have already overshot the time oh my goodness uh, uh, but it is because of the such a vibrant discussion today we have had uh, the last question for jennifer uh, jennifer given your leadership on hiv and gender equality do you feel rights based access to services were badly hit during the pandemic and with women girls and key populations facing the brush uh, the worst brunt uh, how can we push gender equality higher up on agenda as we rebuild during and post pandemic it's a really interesting question uh we could take a long time to answer it and i'm sure everyone has got it uh the first thing i think that in that we we are finding across the board that uh access to services 
um, has decreased. Uh, Eamon put up some statistics. It would be very good, I think, for all of us to be pulling the statistics and the data that we have from various settings. Um, you know, I, I mentioned before that to me, having worked in the field of HIV and key populations for so long and in SRHR, I find it personally a bit heartbreaking that it is taking so long to really shift the needle. It is taking so long for people to have access to, to essential and basic services that are a fundamental right of theirs. Um, we have across the board, there have been uh, uh, contractions in availability of commodities to start with because of changes in, in shipping and so on. We've had the whole issue of lockdown and, and service availability and we look at who are the service providers and where the service providers have been able to actually go and deliver services or not. We have um, the constraints of not only being able to access services, but then the, the fear of going and accessing services. Eamon talked much earlier on about um, a whole range of constraints that, that uh, key populations are facing. On, on the positive side, because I really do think that we have to look at COVID-19 as an opportunity. I really think that the focus on UHC, hence the importance of Eamon's slide on what UHC is and what it isn't. But having good costed plans um, of SRHR, HIV within UHC is critical and ensuring that that issues of gender equity, that issues of leaving no one behind, that the right people are getting the access to the services that they need are fully embedded within those national plans for UHC. I love listening to the community led approaches that we've heard today, because that's providing a degree of innovation where we need to move. Again, coming back to Eamon's presentation, but we could say the same um, in the Pacific. I'll use the example in the Pacific. In the Pacific, getting the needle of contraception availability, uptake and use to shift is really difficult. It has not moved a great deal in, in a long time. The needle on adolescent pregnancies, unintended pregnancies across the region, the, the decrease isn't anywhere near where it needs to be. COVID-19 is really shining that huge spotlight on where we have the gaps and what it is that's needed to be recalibrated. And in a sense, it's actually helping us to be more focused, to be more purposeful in what it is that we do. So whilst I don't think the changes will be immediate, I do think that we are going to have a seismic shift in, in the sorts of services that we need to have available to ensure that no one is left behind and that those issues of gender equity uh, are addressed far faster than they have been for quite some years in the past. Uh, there is a request uh, for uh, short messages for the 16 day activism against gender based violence and World AIDS Day uh, from all the abstract presenters and also from Jenny and Eamon. So that, that, that has been a special request. So we can start with Jenny and then move on. A short message, yes. I, I think that's a tremendous thing to, to say. Um, uh, God, well, my message is, is around key populations. My message is around that it doesn't matter who you are, who you love, what your job is. If you're a sex worker, if you're a transgender person, if you're a person who injects drugs, if you are a gay man or a man who has sex with men, Nobody should ever be experiencing violence anywhere ever. And it's time that we all took collective action to stop all forms of violence everywhere. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ayman? Uh, thanks, Shobna. Um, definitely, I would echo what um, Jen, Jen just said about um, uh, violence. Nobody should be exposed to violence. We talk about key populations, and these are some of the most marginalised people in our societies. They suffer forms of discrimination and stigma 
every day of their lives. And, and and these are the people we need to support and work with to access healthcare and support services from the outset. COVID's made it even more obvious. The, the work that's gone on in many countries, just take the example of Bangladesh, of the community, having to support uh, sex workers and women living with HIV who are supporting their own families, right? Um, uh, and access to, to the basic needs of, um, of survival. Forget the HIV medicine and other things that might be needed, but uh, these uh, just show the fault line so strongly. And, and so my message is we're supposed to be communities that care about each other. When something like COVID comes in, just like the early days of HIV, we see the fault lines get wider. And that's the challenge for all of us. How do we bring our communities together? And we do see in many places after that, then the communities come together and support. And governments need to enable that, not make it harder for them. So, thank you. Thank you. Jude? Jude, can we uh, have Yes. Yeah. I, I'm not sure what I'm going to share, but uh, we are one in that advocacy that there should be no all forms of violence. In the, in the Philippines, we have increasing cases of any type of violence. However, the government should uh, at least prioritize these problems on how we could possibly address this. In our region, we have increasing cases of rape. And that has something to do with uh, maybe uh, poor reporting or monitoring in terms of all of this. And there should be at least intervention that should be sustained how to prevent all of these forms of violence. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Angela? Is Angela there? Angela, can we get your message? Yes. Sorry, thank you so much. Um, I think if I was to make a message, my message would be that violence is everybody's business. I was concerned with the mental health and the emotional pain that trans people, trans men, trans women feel and their denial of gender affirming services. For women with HIV and young girls living with HIV, personal, economic and financial violence is a reality of everyday life. Women and girls have a right to have children. They have a right not to have children and to terminate unwanted pregnancies. And they have a right to have negative children, but that relies on effective elimination of mother to child programs. It is a form of structural violence if our governments aren't eliminating vertical transmission. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can we have a message uh, from Dr. Shivan Ward, please? Dr. Ward, can we have your message? Okay, I, I think he's not there or he has left. So with this, we come to the close of the 12th session of APCR SHR 10 virtual. My sincere thanks to the chairperson, plenary speaker, abstract presenters, and to the participants. Special thanks to our sign language interpreters, Lucy and Nix. I would also like to thank UNFPA and IPPF for their continuous support and help to APCR SHR 10 virtual. We will now meet on Monday, the 7th of December at the same time, 1 p.m. Cambodia time for the 13th APCR SHR 10 virtual session on the theme of gender and sexual based violence and SR SRHR in Asia Pacific. Bye bye till then, stay safe, stay healthy and stay happy. Namaste. Thanks everybody, take care. Thank you, Shoba. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Shoba. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.